In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Word of God that we're meditating on on this Monday, Thursday evening, are recorded for us in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 15 to 25. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of God. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, how awesome and how terrifying it must have been to be a high priest in the Old Testament times. Perhaps we can picture it this way this evening as we're getting those portraits and pictures from God's Word. Let's picture it tonight like an astronaut who's in a spacesuit on a spacewalk. How awesome it is to be an astronaut out there in the middle of space, able to see from miles and miles around you into space and able to look down on the earth and the other planets from that vantage point. But how terrifying to realize that that space that's just that far in front of your face, because of the the wild shifts in the temperature from hugely hot to terribly cold, and because there's no oxygen to keep you alive, that that space could literally suck the life out of you if you came in contact with it. And the only thing preventing that is your spacesuit. How awesome it must have been for the high priest to go into that most holy place where the chief operating officer of the universe had his location among God's people in his flawlessness and his power How awesome, but how terrifying to know that that same holiness could sap the life out of him because of his sins. And the only thing preventing that was the blood. The blood with which he was sprinkled when he was ordained as a high priest and the blood which he brought from a sacrifice that one time of year when he had the chance to go into that most awesome and holy place of God. But he had to come with blood. Tonight, the writer to the Hebrews tells us that we get to go into that most holy place of God. Do we tremble? Or are we awed to go into God's presence? Tonight, Jesus invites us to come into that presence through his holy supper. You see, Jesus is a great high priest, the writer to the Hebrews says. 
We needed a great high priest because all those other priests weren't great enough to take us into God's holy presence. And the writer calls him the great high priest because he's different than all those other priests. And he lets us know how different he is a little bit earlier in his letter when he writes, such a high priest meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. That great high priest, that holy high priest, can go into the most holy place of God on his own. Not that temple, not that tabernacle in the wilderness and that little room, but into the real place where God dwells, into heaven itself, into the very presence of the almighty maker of the universe. But he is a holy high priest, which means that he still goes in there with blood. And that's huge. Whose blood does he go in there with? It's not some lamb's blood. It's not a goat's blood. It's his blood. That blood that allows us to go into that holy place. That blood that came from his body that the writer of the Hebrews says is like that curtain that was in the temple that was torn from top to bottom as we heard a few Wednesdays ago in one of our Lenten meditations. Through that body of Jesus, through that curtain, we have access into God's most holy place. Jesus is like a space suit for us. He's like that blood that the priests took in that protected them and kept them safe in the holy presence of God. In the 16th century, the nation of Denmark was at war and rebelled against the wicked and cruel King Philip II of Spain. So King Philip sent his armies against Denmark and they fought against them. In Rotterdam, one of the larger cities in Denmark, held out for quite a while against the armies of King Philip. But finally, they had to capitulate. And in response to that resistance, in retaliation for that resistance of Rotterdam, the soldiers went from house to house in that city, killing the families in their own homes. There was a group of men, women, and children in a corner house in Rotterdam. And they knew that those soldiers were coming close to their house. And one young man had an idea. He took a goat and he killed it inside the home and he let the blood drip down so that it went underneath the front door of that house. And they heard the soldiers get to the front of that door and they heard them preparing to ram the door in when suddenly one of the soldiers said, wait, let's move on. The work has already been done here. See the blood under the door? That blood protected them. In the same way, you and I are in a dangerous place because there's a warrant for our death because of our sins. There is a curse that has been placed upon us because of our unholiness. Heaven, I mean, de death and hell are hunting us down. But our great high priest protects us from death and hell. And he does it by giving us this holy supper. A holy supper in which he says to us, this blood and this body I give to you for the forgiveness of your sins. That's what the writer to the Hebrews also tells us because he tells us that God says, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sins. Note that he didn't say we don't have any sins. He didn't say we aren't guilty of those sins and deserve to die for those sins. He said the Lord God forgets them. He doesn't remember them. Through this holy meal, God looks at us as if we are holy people. The warrant for our death by sin and hell 
has been taken care of. The work has already been done of death on our Savior Jesus in our place, and his blood now protects us so that we aren't in danger of dying anymore because God looks up at us as his holy people. In fact, here is what Scripture tells us is the way God looks at us. He says, God has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. Like those high priests of the past, Jesus' blood covers us and protects us as we come into God's holy presence. And God sees us only as his holy people belonging to him. And so the master of the universe, that holy God, says to each and every one of us, my dear holy children, be holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. Without Jesus Christ, that demand would terrify us. For who can be holy? But this supper reminds us Jesus' body and blood shed for us means God doesn't remember our sins. He doesn't see our sins. He looks at what we do as if we are holy before him. He sees every work that we do in faith in Jesus as absolutely perfect and pure. God has done that for us by giving us his Holy Spirit and giving us faith. And now the writer to Hebrews comes to us this evening and says, So urge one another on to love and good deeds. That's just another way of saying, urge one another on to holiness. Be holy. And that's exactly what God expects of us. His word says, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. And he helps us. He helps us to do just that. In our lesson from Hebrews, he said, I will put my laws in their hearts. And I will write them on their minds. That's what the Lord did when he gave you faith. He gave you his Holy Spirit to write his word on your hearts and your minds. That's your new self. That's the Jesus that now dwells in your heart and lives in you and allows you to be able to live for God. And everything that you do in faith in Jesus is holy because it's done through Jesus who makes us holy. And so we begin to live like Jesus in our lives. And think how Jesus lived, especially on this Monday, Thursday evening. Think about Jesus in that room with his disciples, taking off his gown, putting a robe around his waist, and getting down on the ground and washing his disciples' feet in self-sacrificing love. The writer says, keep on encouraging one another to that until the day comes. The day. That's the last day. The day when this flesh that still isn't holy will also be holy, just like that new self in us is holy. And we will be holy, holy, completely and totally holy before God in his holiness to enjoy his holiness for eternity. But until that day, we struggle. We struggle to be holy. We struggle to show that kind of self-sacrificing love that our Lord showed his disciples. We struggle because we are still sinful. And so each day, again and again, we see selfishness. We see that we fail to follow Jesus' example in our lives. And that's why our Lord Jesus gave us this Holy Supper. Because again and again, as we approach this Holy Supper, aware of our sinful nature and the sins that that sinful nature causes us to do, again and again, as we approach, our Savior again and again gives us his body and his blood and says, you're forgiven. God doesn't remember your sins anymore. In the news recently, there was some articles about a female astronaut, maybe you read some of that, who didn't get to go on a spacewalk because there was a problem with the spacesuit, 
And she was very disappointed that she didn't get to go on that spacewalk. That's how much confidence those astronauts have in that spacesuit. They aren't afraid. They aren't trembling to have to go out on those spacewalks. They want to go. They're eager. They want to get in that spacesuit and go out there. They trust that spacesuit, and it gives them confidence and eagerness. In the same way, Jesus gives us confidence and eagerness. Because through the blood of Jesus, we are holy in God's sight. We don't have to be afraid, but we can be eager to live our lives for him because all that we do for him, all of our works that we do in faith in Jesus are holy before God. They're wonderful works. So dear friends, be eager to do good. Be eager to be holy. And as the writer says, encourage one another. Encourage one another also by not forgetting to come together here as saints, as holy ones of God. He says, don't give up that time of meeting together. Keep on coming together and encouraging one another to live holy lives and be encouraged by receiving again and again this holy supper of our Lord. And cling to what this supper says to us again and again. It says that we are forgiven. We are holy in God's sight. Therefore, be holy. Live a holy life. That is, be separated from the world to serve your Lord Jesus. Amen.